So let's begin by reviewing the previous lecture where we were continuing with the convolutional neural networks. Uh, we will talk today about capsule networks, which we sort of started in the last lecture. And then we'll move on to issues such as what happens when time is involved. And for that, we will talk about something called re uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, and then hopefully time permitting, we'll talk about autoencoders, some examples of CNNs and something called regularization. Okay, so let's see how far we can get today. So uh, this is a review of the previous lecture where we had spoken about uh, being able to classify uh, images in one of two categories and we looked at Y1 and Y2 being able to predict the probability or some measure of whether um, an image was of one type or the other. And we looked at back propagation, and then we looked at the example of uh, an image in which you could write an X or an O and to be able to create filters to be able to differentiate between an X and an O. And we looked at various examples of that. And we looked at an end-to-end -end, uh, CNN network in which um, various stages uh, convolution was being applied, then max uh, pooling, as well as uh, the activation function, which was ReLU, which was being applied. So um, this was the last uh, lecture. And one of the issues that we looked, we wanted to um, address, and this was discussed towards the last lecture, is what happens if you have an image which is uh, has one of these problems, which is referred to as a Picasso problem. Okay, so if you've seen some of these um, images, uh, if you've seen some of the paintings of Picasso, I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, poster that I found. It says, if you're having plastic surgery, make sure that the surgeon does not have a Picasso hanging in his waiting room. Right. So basically, it means you don't want to get your face distorted. All right, and this was how Picasso, for some reason, some odd reason or the other, typically drew his images in which you know it was things were distorted. So if you have an image, uh, if for instance you had a Picasso uh, painting uh, and you try to use CNN, and the image looked something like this instead of the normal face, then the question is, would CNN be able to differentiate between those two? And I think towards the last lecture, we convinced ourselves that uh, because CNN is simply looking for certain features and it finds certain features, it can find us a nose, it can find a lip, it can find ear, uh, eyes. So it will simply say, yes, those are present without being able to say what is the relationship of those, okay? Whether the eyes are symmetrically above the nose, whether the lip is below it, whether the sizes are proportional or not. Okay, so all of these things are, of course, important if you want to be able to say that, yes, this is a normal face. And if it isn't, you should at least be able to differentiate between a normal human face and one which is not normal. Okay. So the question is, how would you do that? And um, if you had to, for example, based on whatever knowledge you have, based on uh, what you've already studied in neural networks and what you might have studied in maths, can you make a change in this network? so that it is able to differentiate between an image in which the face is normal versus an image in which the features, though present, but they are in random places. And I think we had some suggestion last time as well, and let's go ahead and listen to you. Very good. Yeah, absolutely right. So you would want to have some kind of a, a, a measure so that you can calculate the distance, right? So you would ideally want, so if this is, for example, X, then you would, in a normal phase, this might be two X or three X, right? So you'd want to have some kind of a measure between those uh, features. So other thoughts, what else? Is the distance alone that's important? Because here yeah, the distance is also there, it's still three X, but the placement, Right. So the placement. So how would you be able to define placement? So if let's say you said the nose is at the center of the image. OK, so you could say, well, if you're looking bottom uh, top down and if you're going through the image like this, then maybe there should be a sequence that first you should have 
the eyebrows and the eyes and so on, and then the nose and then the mouth. So that also makes sense. But if you remember when we talked about earlier, when we when somebody had suggested sequencing, we had said that sequencing is not natural in a convolutional neural network. In a CNN, uh, you could do uh, sequencing. I'm not saying you, you couldn't, uh, but all I'm saying is that it hasn't been applied in real world neural networks or people haven't been able to successfully do that. Perhaps you can come up with an algorithm which is able to do that. We're not disregarding that. But in convolutional neural networks, you use filters and maybe something else. So sequencing is one thing, but let's think beyond that. What else could you do? So if you want, if you want to have, if let's say this is at place location zero comma zero, and you want to have the eye in two eyes in these directions, then what mathematical operation or what concepts in math and calculus have we learned, which could be used over here? Angles, very good. So you could say that the angle, if this is zero, zero, then the angle to the eye should either be plus 15 degrees or let's say minus 15 degrees. Very good, excellent. So now we're getting there. What else? Uh, so, so angle is clearly important. What else? The distance, right? So have you, have you come across a concept in math which talks about both angle and distance? What is that called? So you've heard of these things which look like this, which have both an angle and a distance. What are those things called? They're called vectors. vectors. Very vectors. good. So somebody answered online. So we're going to use a concept of vectors, which basically has an angle and a distance. All right. Remind me of those cartoon movies, which anyway, forget about that. Uh, I'll give the, the reference later on. Okay. Um, it's kind of funny. So, um, so vectors are, are important over here. So let's see how we can use vectors. So, um, so we're going to use um, so uh, in a classical neural network, you don't see uh, vectors being employed anywhere. All it's doing is it's taking an image over here and it's passing it through a neural network and that has filters. Now does filters embody the concept of, of vectors? Filters, not really, right? You've, you've looked at filters and all it's doing is applying a filter on top of another image, right? It takes this filter and it applies it in a particular corner or or in the middle and so on. But there's no concept of a vector, okay? So somebody had to come up with a concept which introduced this and guess who it was? It was our favorite uh, researcher, Mr. Jeff Hinton. He, as you know, has been behind, he's called the sort of the uh, father of, neural, of uh, you know, deep neural networks because he's one, he's one of the persons who from University of um, uh, Toronto has done some very seminal work in this area. So the last, decade or so, it's his research, which has been the pioneering work in deep, neural, in deep neural networks. So he came up with the idea that let's use a different concept and he called it capsule networks. This is very recent, this last three years. And in fact, only some recent research is coming out. In fact, one of my uh, PhD students, scholars uh, um, uh, is, is working in this, uh, Anwar al -Haq. And he's used this and he's just defended his uh, proposal successfully in which he's shown that capsule networks can also be used successfully and there's a lot of a large body of knowledge in the in the recent past which is supporting this as well so basically the idea of capsule networks is that you're going to have a capsule which is going to have a length and a direction i'm sorry okay so i'm noticing that uh, i'm getting a little bit of a hiccup in the internet there was a drop, but it's come back. So hopefully things should be better. Um, so um, in, in a capsule network, basically you have the concept of vector and the vector consists of a length and a direction, obviously. And these things are called capsules, okay? So, um, and in the capsule network, you will also use the CNN. So it uses both the CNN. In addition, it also uses vectors, okay? So here's your convolutional network, which has the ReLU and so on. And then it has what are referred to as capsules. Okay, so primary capsules, secondary capsules, and these are layered. So you go through one capsule network and then you go through another capsule network. Just like in deep neural networks, you have series of layers. Okay, so now what we're going to do is take a look at a very simple example. 
and see how this is applied, okay? So here's a two layered capsule network and I'm going to use a first layer and a second layer. So the CNN portion is going to be assumed. I'm not going to talk about that. That's already there, okay? In addition, there's going to be capsules. And of course, this would require a lot more time than I have, but I'm just going to give you a, just a touch of what capsule networks are, okay? So let's assume that we have these two capsules and these can be thought of as objects, okay? Just like an object-oriented programming. Here is an object, which is a rectangular object. And here's another object, which is a triangle object. So a rectangle and a triangle is the capsules in the first layer, okay? Now, the, as, as you know, in, in deep neural networks, as you go deeper and deeper into the network, you have higher layer, um, uh, you know, images, okay? So the images become a combination of the lower layer features. So here's a second layer, which has a higher uh, concept built in. And here, this is a boat and a house. Okay, so again, these will be called, referred to as capsules over here. Okay, now um, you can see that in the simplistic case, the, uh, the boat and both the house and the boat are actually built off both of these lower layer, layer capsules, right? So this is a triangle, this is a rectangle, both of these make up this, this boat. Right. Similarly, the house is made up of a triangle and a rectangle. However, there's a difference. And the difference is you can clearly see that here, the rectangle is put in as it is in both of these cases, but the triangle is rotated. Although the size is not changing, but let's just focus on the angles right now. So here, this seems to be, have been rotated by uh, almost 360 degrees, a little less than that. And in this case, the rotation is perhaps less, okay? So, um, so if I showed you the, the approximate rotations over here, uh, you can see that the rectangle hasn't been rotated in both of these cases, but the triangle has been rotated by, let's say, approximately 285 degrees, a little less than 360 degrees over here. This is about 200 and... Sir, one more question. Yes. Sir, this capsule, how do you define it? How do you define any object or what? I mean, 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 I mean. Right. So basically, a capsule can be thought of an object, all right, just like in the CNN, you had a feature. You had a certain feature which could have been an edge, for example. But here, the difference is that not only does it ha does it have a shape, uh, but it also has these two other features. It also has a vector associated with it. Okay, and the vector has both a length and a direction. So that's a basic difference between a CNN feature and a capsule, additional of a vector. Okay, is that clear, Jafar? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the basic definition of a capsule. So now you can see that um, in this case, now capsules will be there in, in every layer, okay? So these would be the capsules in the first layer, these would be the capsules in the in a deeper layer, okay? They would still be called, uh, these, instead of calling them features, we'll call them capsules because they also have a vector associated with them, okay? So now you can see that uh, this, uh, this high level feature, okay, this capsule comprises of the lower level, the first layer um, uh, capsules, but um, it also has the relationship that the rectangle is as is, but the triangle is goes through a certain rotation. Okay, so now after training, it will understand that a boat will have um, a, a rectangle capsule but also a triangle capsule and there'll be a relationship between them of a certain degree, okay? There could also be a relationship between the size. For example, you could say, well, both of these are of the original size, right? But if, for example, you said that the, the boat looked like this and it had a very small rectangle over here, you would say that the, the, si the size is also now changing, okay? Not only is the, the angle changing, but the size is now, uh, the, the triangle is now one fourth the size of, of, the, of the rectangle, for example, but let's not look at that, okay? Let's just look at the changes in the angle. So you understand that now the boat has comprised of both of these lower level capsules, but there's a relationship between the angles, okay? Similarly now for the house, you can see that it also comprises of the rectangle, but the triangle has gone through a different rotation. You can see that here it was almost at 360 degrees, but here it's a little less. You can see it's basically 
this bottom edge is now over here, right? Versus this bottom edge was over here in this case. So it's gone through a different level of rotation. Okay, I hope that's clear. That the relationship between these first layer objects and the second layer is changed based on the amount of rotation that one has compared to the other. Okay, so now after it's learned this relationships, it understands that the second layer capsules comprise of the first layer capsules through certain relationships which are based on vectors. Okay, not going through a lot of details, but just giving you the idea. Now let's take a look at this image. Suppose that you have, you're given this image in the second layer. You can see that this is now no longer just the original image, which was like this, but I've rotated it slightly. I've rotated it by something like 15 degrees, okay? So now this image is, is rotated. This image is also rotated by 15 degrees, okay? Now, if this image is rotated by 15 degrees, you know that the rectangle will be rotated by 15 degrees, right? Because it was at zero degrees originally, and the triangle should be rotated by how much? If it's a boat, it should be 285 plus 15 degrees, right? So you have that over here, 285 plus 15 degrees. The triangle should now be rotated by, if it is a boat, the, the triangle should be rotated by 300 degrees, okay? That is a question. Yeah. So I want to ask that, what is the purpose of this network? Okay, so so going back, uh, so the purpose of this of this network is to be able to differentiate between a normal face, as in this example, and what you might call a distorted face. Yes, but what about in this rectangle and triangle example? Okay, so in this rectangle and triangle, I'm building up to that. So you have to wait a little bit, be a little bit more patient. Okay. Oh, so okay, first, thanks. understand the concepts, and then I will show you what is the purpose. I haven't gotten okay. to that yet. So, um, so what I'm showing you now is that I've rotated the, the boat by 15 degrees. And if it's properly understood the relationship between the two capsule net, the low level capsules, it will understand that for a boat, if this is rotated by 15 degrees, this should be rotated by 285 plus 15 degrees. If the house is also rotated by 15 degrees, then the the triangle, which is a low level capsule should be rotated by 160 plus 15 degrees, right? If this is rotated by 15 degrees, you understand that now, okay? So you can see that over here, that um, the, the, for the house, the rotation will now be 160 plus 15, and the, for the triangle will be rotated differently based on whether it's a house being rotated or if it's a boat being rotated, okay? now. Again, so this was the basic concept. Now I'm, I'm going to jump now, okay? I'm going to go to a, um, to a stronger statement. So what a capsule network does is that for every capsule in one layer, it tries to predict the output of every capsule in the next layer, okay? So just understand that. And by the way, if you want to have a better understanding of this, I haven't gone into so much detail, you can look at this a uh, YouTube video as well, which from which I've drawn some of the concepts over here. Okay, so um, so let me repeat that every capsule in one layer. So this is first layer and this is the second layer. Okay, so every capsule in the first layer will try to predict the output of every capsule in the next layer. Okay, so let's say that you have this image this image in the second layer. Right, so it will say, well, I've detected, so the rectangle capsule detected was detected with a rotation of 15 degrees, right? Just like in my previous example. Now, based on this, it will predict that it is either a boat or a house, right? So far, so good. It's found a rectangle in the image and it's saying that it could be either be a boat or a house. It doesn't know yet, okay? Now, the next thing what's going to happen is that the triangle capsule is also going to make a similar prediction. Right? So the triangle capsule is going to say, well, if it's a boat, now look at this triangle. Okay, it's found this triangle in this position over here. This is the triangle that it's found. So it says that if it's a boat, then it has to, it is going to be rotated by 15 degrees. You can see that. Okay, this was the original boat. This has gone through 15 degrees. So its prediction is that if it's a boat, then it will have been rotated by 15 degrees. Okay, so far so, so good. 
However, it says that if it is a, a house, okay? Now look at this house. If it says that if it's a house and you're trying to put, you're using the triangle to make a prediction, it's saying that, um, so if it's a house, it's got, the rotation will have to be completely upside down because you can see that um, the house, the triangle is almost flipped upside down. Okay, so it basically says that the triangle predicts that if it's a boat, it should be rotated by 15 degrees, but if it's a house, it has to be rotated by 160 degrees. Okay, so the this is the rotation, this is the um, rotation expected from the um, from the rectangle capsule, but the but the triangle capsule predicts that if it's a house, it's going to be almost upside down. Okay, so. Think about that. I'm not explaining this in too much detail, but um, listen to this lecture perhaps repeatedly and you'll be able to understand this. So basically what we're saying is that since the rectangle and triangle predictions are agreeing, okay? So the rectangle is predicting a, a shift by 15 degrees. Uh, the triangle is also predicting a shift by 15 degrees if it's a boat. But the uh, if, it's a, if it's a house, both of these are not agreeing with each other, okay? These two are not agreeing with each other. So as a conclusion, the presence of a boat is predicted and not that of a house. Okay. So this may take a while for you to, to completely understand this, but I'm giving you a very rough picture as to how it works. The actual details, if I spend a lot more time, it would take me maybe an hour to explain the whole thing. Okay. But I hope you've got an idea how vectors can be used to show relationships. Now, if you go back and try to see uh, in this case, okay? So, so now do you think that if you had a capsule network, would it be able to predict that this is different from a normal phase? Can, can you not think of that? Why? Because in a capsule network, it would say that in a phase, the eyes, the, the higher layers, there's a relationship between them, right? There's an angle, and there is a direction as well as a size, okay? These two have to be proportional. So if the, if the nose comes out, if the eye comes out to be extremely small, right? It will also say that the eye is not proportional to the original understanding of a face, okay? If this angle is coming out to be very wrong, so this angle over here is coming out instead of being either in this direction or in this direction, it's coming out to be in a completely different direction it will say, well, this does not correspond to a normal phase. Why? Because it had understood the vector, it had learned the vector relationships between the different objects or different, between the different features in a normal phase. Okay? Yeah. Sorry? Okay. So you're saying that, let's say this is Captain, one of those guys from Captain Hook's movie, and he's got a patch on his eye. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so when you're going through the learning process, it will learn a lot of different features. Remember the CNN, it would learn all kinds of eyes with glasses, without glasses, closed, open, and so on. And all of those relationships will be there. So in a, the normal CNN will work. So if a normal CNN is able to recognize, if you, if you remember all of those images, I don't know if I have those here, but in the normal image, it would recognize all of the different types of features in a face. So I don't have that here, but you can see that in, in this image, right? So it would learn all the different features in a normal face. Okay, yeah. Yes, so the normal CNN will still be there, okay? It will learn all the features of a normal face, but in addition, it will also have capsule layers, okay? And those capsule layers will now also show relationship between those features. So this is an addition to the normal CNN, okay? So this sort of gives you an idea as to what kinds of extensions one can do to the normal CNN when you have different challenges, okay? This was the first challenge that we, that we came across. And this is, more, this is the most recent. And this was very interesting, so I brought this up first. But let's take a look at another challenge, okay? Now, this is also something I mentioned before. What if time is involved? 
Okay, and this was resolved much earlier than uh, capsule networks. But let's say that you have two images. Okay, you have this image which occurs, let's say, a fraction of a second before, and this image is a slightly later image, right? This is, let's say, a video, and these are two still images of that video. Okay, you can see that there is a relationship between them. So the, the legs are in slightly different position, but roughly the rest of the body of the horse and the rider is more or less the same. But there is uh, slight changes in the feet and so on. Okay. Now the question is, if you learned this image in the previous instance of that of that image. Okay. So let's say that this was at x t minus one, and this was an another image which was given at x t. Now let's say if you've learned this image and you've realized that this is an image of a horse and a horse rider and they're, and they're, you know galloping away. Now in the next image, can you take advantage of that? Are most video images, especially when there's a sequence, are they related to each other? As I said in the last lecture, clearly they are. If I take a video of this class, then there are four people over here, so happens right now, then a second later, there'll still be four people, right? At best, you might be shaking your head and so on. You might be moving your hands and so on, right? But there won't be a drastic uh, change. There won't be like four elephants in this room. So obviously, the images are, are related to each other. So if you've already spent all this time to be able to figure out what this image is, should we not use that in the subsequent image? It makes sense to use that, right? So the question is, how do we do that? And that's the question to you. So, so far we've learned that in, how, how do we actually train our neural network? Go back to what's the training process? So we're learning the edges, but we're not manually learning it. We're going through a process uh, and a, a mechanism, which is called what? How do we learn an image in a neural network? What's the basic concept? Remember, you use the output. Okay, so let's take, so this is the, so this was your back propagation algorithm. You took the output and you looked at the label data. Okay, and you compared, you calculated an error and you use that error using a gradient descent to change the, the weights in the neural network. So that was a basic mechanism to be able to train the neural network. Okay, now go back over here. So we can use the output to be able to train the, the, the gradient using gradient descent, we can train the weights over here, all those weights that are uh, at each one of these points. Okay. So this was your back propagation algorithm. Now it, what it's doing is it's taking the output and it's saying that the out and there's a label. So somebody's told them that this is uh, you know, a horse galloping horse. So it's going to train that and it's going to calculate the weights based on the error, okay? Now, how do we extend this when you have um, time involved? Okay, so this is sort of like the stuff that we learned in stochastic processes. Now you have data that is not only a still image with an input and an output and weights to be trained, but now there's a sequence of timing involved. So there is not only X of T, but there was also an image at X T minus one. So how do we train this using back propagation? So we, we've got basic back propagation here. How can you modify back propagation so that it also takes into advantage the previous training? Okay, so we're trying to train the weights over here, right? And now we trying to use the previously trained weights to be able to improve this training. So how do you use, how do you do that? Any thoughts? Previously, we were simply using this output over here. Now what we, what do we need to do? Some small change in the back propagation algorithm. It's, it's right here in front of you. What we're trying to do is trying to change, trying to train these weights based on the pre-trained weights. Okay, you've already trained this image. You've already got all the weights trained over here and here, okay? But now you have another image and we're trying to use the pre-trained weights over here to be able to train over here. So how do we do that? Sorry? 
we can take the average. So we could take the average of this and this and use them where? In, in the next instance, perhaps. So the new weights. So we're trying to calculate the new weights over here. And a very good suggestion, what we could simply do, do is use, instead of starting as completely uh, random numbers, remember we when we started doing the training weights, we started with completely random numbers, right? What we could do is simply use the previous training weights. Perfect suggestion, right? We simply take the previous train weights and we could use maybe the average, but we don't even have to use average. We could use it directly. So we could use this weight and we could use it directly over here. Okay, so that's one way. Very good suggestion. However, what it doesn't involve, what is not complete is that there is a relationship as well between these two images. In other words, if for example, uh, let's look at something a little different. So this was timing involved, right? Now uh, let's think about um, your, st your stock market, right? So the stock market, as I said, may be going something like this, maybe not the best example, but let's say the temperature in this room. Okay, that's another example of a stochastic process. So the temperature in this room will, maybe it's, it's rising, okay, as the day is progressing, or if it's in the evening, it's going down, right? Normally at noon time, it has very high temperature at night comes down, right? So the, the relation, there's a relationship between the temperature at time xt, and the and the relation and the temperature at time t plus one, right? If it's uh, during the day, it's going down. If it's in the evening, or vice versa, you know, there's a relationship. Um, if, for example, you're talking about natural language processing, if this is not images, but it's actually words, okay? Now think about you're saying a word. You're saying, um, think of a, of any sentence. You say, uh, think of a sentence. Um, I like cats, okay? Suppose this is a sentence which says, I like cats, right? Now, is there a relationship between those words? So suppose I say, I like, then the next word is probably going to be a noun. It's not going to be an adjective. It's not going to be a preposition and so on, okay? If you know a little bit of grammar, it's, and if you like, and if, if there is, if a lot of people like cats versus dogs, then, most likely is going to predict that cats are more likable, maybe dogs are more likable, depending on which, uh, you, which country you're in or which culture you're from. But, but there's going to, you can understand that there's a relationship between those words. And this is what is there when you're trying to predict, uh, you know, in natural language processing, you're trying to predict somebody, what somebody is going to about to say, okay? So for example, as, as I said, uh, the GPT-3 example that I gave you right at the beginning of this course, which was able to converse in natural language, right? You asked it a question in natural English and it could actually guess or it could make a prediction as to what the answer could be, okay? So each one of those words, when it was saying something in response, it was actually creating a series of words which had a relationship between them. So the bottom line over here, what I'm trying to say is that there is not only are these two linked that they should be similar, but there's a relationship between them, right? So if I say, I like, then the next word actually in this case cannot be like, okay? It may be a cat or a dog or a horse or whatever, but it will definitely not be like again. You can't say, I like, like, okay? But if it was an image of a horse running, most likely that would be similar to the, the other horse with slight changes. So depending on what you're doing, there's a relationship between these, these different images or these different words, okay? So now think about it. Um, not only do you want th these weights to be similar to the previous weights, but you want them to be related to them. And those relationships could be thought of as a link between them, okay? Remember when we related these two together, what did we do? We created, a, a, we, create, we said that this neural network could predict what the relationship is, right? So this neur the neurons over here were linked to the neurons over here, and this was using a neural network, okay? A neural network was being used to make that prediction. So what we could do is not only have these connected, but we could put in a neural network in the middle, which sort of is able to predict what the relationship is, okay? 
So this is what we're going to do. We earlier we had the relationship over here, okay, and over here, and this was connected using neurons, a neural network. So now what we're going to do is simply say that this data is now linked to the subsequent data. Okay, the, so this these neurons, when you're going to train them, they're not only going to be trained on the on the image that's coming in, but they're going to be related to the previous images and the previous weights and the previous outputs. Okay, that's a fundamental change in the algorithm. You understand that now. What we're saying is that there is a relationship in time. Not only are we relating them in that particular time, okay, but we're also saying that they're related to the the stuff that happened in the previous time. Okay, so I hope you're able to understand that. All it requires is that when you when you training this. Y of t is not only going to depend on x of t and all of these weights, but it's going to depend on the weights in the previous time domain. Okay, so now the weights will also have a time domain in it. Okay, just like in stochastic processes, it's going to perhaps depend on all of these values which were at time t minus one. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of recurrent neural networks because this is the basic concept. All it's saying is that now what you'll see, you've, you'll often see this, is that there'll be a simple loop, okay? And the loop will be in time, okay? So not only will you have a convolutional neural network, but you will simply have a loop which will link it to what happened in the previous time domain, okay? So uh, when if you take a course in deep neural networks, you'll go into a lot more detail, but this is about all I have time for, okay? And then this uh, relates to another much more powerful uh, network, which is called LSTMs, which is actually used, um, which is, uh, you know, an evolutionary concept which derives from uh, recurrent neural networks, and it's a little bit more sophisticated. But I'm not going to talk about that. It leads to a lot of new uh, networks, and they go by the name of transformers. And you might hear about these. And GPT-3, for example, is based on, on the concept of transformers and so on. I'm not talking about all of that, but just to give you an idea that all of those are based on the concept of a recurrent neural network. Why? Because it has time involved, okay? So all of these combine convolutional neural networks as well as the concept of time, okay? That's all you need to know as far as this course is concerned. Now, let's talk about one additional challenge. So, so far I've talked about the first challenge was that you had uh, images with were distorted and we use capsule networks to resolve them. If you had time involved, you could use RNNs or the, 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 the sequel to them, which are called LSTMs or transformers, those networks, okay? Now let's look at another major, um, uh, another major aspect of um, neural networks. And the question here is, do you think that you can use image compression with neural networks, okay? So neural networks are very powerful. And now think about how could one do image compression, okay? So think about um, a normal neural network. So here, this is a normal neural network, okay? Forget about, forget about the time for the minute, but this is a normal neural network. It goes through various layers. Now, if you wanted to compress this in this image, so let's say you had X, T minus, X of T and you had Y of T, but you wanted this image to be compressed somehow. Now remember what, what is it doing? It's basically learning features, okay? Yeah, over here, you might be learning edges over here. In, a, in another stage, you might be learning you know, faces and so on. So it's learning the essential features of your image, okay? Now, when you compress an image, what do you think is happening? Have you learned uh, compression in any course so far? So for example, if you had a series of data. I remember, I think I might have taught you compression when I taught you um, introduction to computing. I said that, let's say you have a large image and it's simply a black image, right? If you want to compress that, what could you do? Go back two years back, right? How would you, sorry? You could change the resolution, but how would you compress the same data so instead of saying it has a black pixel, black, 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 and you repeat that thousand times, what could you simply say if you're trying to compress that? Yeah. 
Exactly. You could simply say that here's one black pixel and it's going to be repeated a thousand times, right? So you say that in two, you know, sort of pieces of information instead of repeating that in a, in a very brute force may, manner, right? So compression can actually reduce the, the, can have the same content in it, but it can be represented in a very simple way, okay? So now think about if you were trying to represent a face and you're trying to compress it, so what would be the important features? Now, let's say that, well, a face is kind of complicated, but let's say that you had, um, let's say that um, you had a, a picture and the picture simply had, you know, a plus in it, okay? Now, if you want to compress this, how could you compress it? And let's say there are different pictures, each one of them has a plus in it. Um, and you want to compress these images. So what, are, what is the main feature in this image? A lot of it is just emptiness, right? Most of it is just blank, but there is an important content, which is the main feature, which is the image, which is, has a plus in it, right? Another image could be, it has a, you know, a circle in it. So the, the way you could compress these two images is you could say that, well, the main feature is a circle here, Okay, the main feature is a plus over here, but you could say, well, this occurs in a particular portion of, of, the, of the image. Okay, so this is what image compression is. It takes the main feature in the image and it says that I don't need all of this, you know, emptiness to be compressed. I can just remove all of that. And I can take this plus over here, or I can take this, and this is all I need to know. And I need to know maybe some, some information about its size, and maybe the location where it is, okay? So now think about um, if, you have, um, if you have an uh, uh, a deep neural network, you're already getting the, the, the main features in as part of the weights that you've learned, right? So if you go back over here, for example, um, this image over here, you can see that in layer four, it has certain features that it's learned. I hope you can see this. So this is, it's, it's learning certain features about this bird, right? It's, it's learned that there are legs and it has a body and so on. So it doesn't need a lot more, but using this feature, if you can just capture that feature, maybe you can re-expand that into the full bird, okay? But with maybe some loss, because you may not know what the color of the, of the bird is, right? But you can just from the image, you can see that it is a, a bird with long legs. Okay, so, so this layer over here can, can very essentially capture the main features of that image. Okay, so you can see how it can actually reduce some of the complexity in the image. So this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to use this concept of something called an autoencoder. Okay, so an autoencoder, the concept is very simple. You take an input image. Okay, here's your input image. Okay, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to compress it. So you're going to have a deep neural network, but it's going to sort of have a bottleneck, okay? What does the bottleneck mean? That is becoming smaller and smaller. The width is becoming smaller and smaller, okay? Now, as it learns, and then it's going to have, a, this is what is called an encoder, and this is what is called a decoder. So it's, it's going to expand again. So it's going to compress itself, into a, a, a layer which, whose width is very small. So let's say the original width was four, it's going to become three, and then it's going to become two. So width is becoming smaller and smaller. Then it's going to decompress. It's going to become again three, and then go back to the original four, okay? Now it's trying to learn itself. It's trying to make sure that this image, these weights that are learned, capture the, es the essence of that image. So, you want, so the question is, what should be the output? What should Y be? Normally we're training it, right? In the CNN network, we're saying that when we put, when we give a certain image, we're saying that, uh, well, this is a horse. So we're going to label it as a horse. But now we're trying to make it learn the main features of itself, okay? So what should the output be? What should the training data be? In other words, the Y hat, that we're trying to train, 
what should the y hat be? Not the question, sorry, what the y is, but what should the training data be? You're trying to make it learn itself. So what should y hat be? You've got input is x as a result of some initial ne neural network, which is completely random. It generates some output y. Now you want to generate an error, right? The error or loss is going to be based on the difference between the label data and the output. So the question is, what is the label data should be? Okay, it's on the screen, okay? You're trying to train it on itself. You're trying to train. So in other words, you're taking an image, you want to compress it. And now when you want to decompress it, what do you want it to be? You want to be as close as possible to the original image, right? That's what happens, right? When you take an image and you compress it and you put it on WhatsApp, uh, and sometimes it compresses the image when, when it decompresses on your mobile phone, it looks a little distorted. It doesn't look, it doesn't have the same quality, but ideally you want the, it to be as good a replica of when it was sent by the original sender, right? You want it to be as good as, as, as accurate as possible. So you want to train it on what? On the original image. So y hat should be equal to, y hat should be equal to x, right? So in an auto encoder, it's a very simple network. You have an encoder, you have a bottleneck and you have a decoder, and then you're basically training it to on itself, okay? Now, my next question is, remember we said there are different types of machine learning. Uh, what are the different types of machine learning? There's supervised, there's unsupervised, and some others as well, right? Now, is this supervised or unsupervised? So when you were training it that this was a horse, okay, you had to say that this was a horse and a rider, right? Somebody had to label it that this is H-O-R-S-E, this is a horse. But when you're training it on itself, do you think that's supervised or that's unsupervised? It's unsupervised. unsupervised. Why? Because you simply take the input and you make that the label. So nobody has to actually figure out what the output is because the output is simply the input. So you can, so training an autoencoder is very simple. Training most neural networks is very tough. Why? Because if you're taking a thousand images, and you want it to be trained on, to be able to classify whether it's a horse or a bird or a dog and so on, then somebody has to take each one of those images and tell the neural network that, hey, this is a horse, this is a dog, this is a cat, uh, you know, running cat, this is a sleeping dog and so on. So all of that training has to be done and guess who's going to do the training? It's going to be us humans, right? It's not going to be automatic. But in an autoencoder, it's automatic. Whatever input you give, is simply the, the label, all right? So it's, you simply want to train. So you could take arbitrarily millions and billions of images from the, from the internet, and you could simply feed it into a, an autoencoder and make the output, the label, simply equal to the input. And all of a sudden you let it train overnight and you'll get a, 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 a neural network, which will, able, which will perhaps be able to compress the image, okay? So it's a very powerful technique. Now the question is, um, how is this going to be used, okay? So let's take a look at some examples of how in, out, autoencoders are used. So one of the ways that it can be used is let's say that we're doing image compression and this is the original image, okay? There's a series of hand label, hand numbers uh, digits, okay? And, and this comes from something called MNIST, uh, which is a very popular data, data set of handwritten numbers. Now let's say we want to compress it to two dimensional versus 5D, right? What does this mean? This is a 2D, okay? And 5D would mean that the width would be, would be more, okay? So which would, when you decompress it, which would have more loss, okay? The one which was more compressed, 2D, or the one which was less compressed, 5D? Naturally, the one which is less compressed, would be able to have a better uh, better uh, comparison with the original image, right? So you can see over here that in the 2D, uh, I don't know if that is so visible over here or not, but uh, let's take a look at this nine over here, okay? Which is a better replica of the original nine? Well, I think it should be the 5D, that's slightly better. The 2D has a little bit more loss, 
Okay, you can perhaps see that in other images. Um, yeah, so, so look at this. Now this is, uh, this will be interesting if you keep looking at it. Sorry? The seven in the, in over here. And sometimes it comes up with completely different numbers. Okay, so look at this uh, some more and you'll be able to figure out that the 5D should be better than the 2D. Okay, it will require a little bit more. Sorry? Seven. Bottom right, six. Yeah, so you look at the seven over here, yeah. So the seven is pretty bad. Look at the original seven and this seven. So you can see this is a much better replica and this got pretty badly replicated. Okay, there's a question online. Yes, sir. I was asking, how will this work if, uh, for example, if uh, we are talking about this, you know, 2D space and 5D spaces, will it always be a, lo a lossy compression? Okay, very good. So is the, the question is very, very critical. Is that will it always be lossy compression? In other words, suppose you were actually sending numbers, right? You said, uh, please send a million, uh, you know, a thousand dollars to my account, and here's the account number, right? The, like a normal bank transaction, and it goes through that. When it comes out, do you think that the account numbers might be missed? For instead of your account number, it could be somebody else's account number, and is that important? It's pretty important, right? You don't want the money to go into your friend's account, and if it's a thousand dollars, you don't want you want exactly thousand dollars. You want not, don't want hundred dollars, right? Or you don't want to pay, you know ten thousand dollars. So in some cases, uh, whether it's slightly lossy, if it's an image, you don't mind if it's slightly lossy, right? As lo you can, you know, in most cases, uh, you know, if it's lossy, it has certain advantages. You know, you can send that image really fast on the network, right? Most of the times, you use WhatsApp, it goes really fast because it compresses it a little bit. But if you want to send the original image, it might take a lot longer. And for an image, it's not really important. But if you were sending something which was very critical, you don't want it to be lossy. So the question here is, is this lossy? Do you think it's lossy or it's, it's going to be a 100% replica of the original data? It can be, but what do you think it's going to happen? Most places it's going to be lossy. Why? Because you're basically looking at the basic features. So you in, over here, you've sort of learned that there's a zero, but even the zero was not accurately learned. Remember that somebody could write a zero like this, somebody could write a zero like this and so on. So it's basically understood what a zero looks like and it's going to make a best replica of that, okay? It's going to learn the basic feature of what a zero is and a one is and a two is, and it's going to replicate that. But it's, it's certainly most likely if this is if this is a bottleneck, okay? If, if the original image was, let's say, uh, had a width of a thousand and the bottleneck was, let's say a hundred, then it's certainly going to be lossy. It's going to have compressed it. And that's the whole idea, okay? But you don't want to do lossy compression when you're doing financial transactions, for example. Okay, so the answer, the short answer was uh, that yes, it's going to be a lossy compression. Let's take another look. Uh, so what if you wanted to, for example, remove noises from these images, okay? So the question is, how could you do that? Uh, this is, these are images, and these images, sometimes you have old pictures and they're very noisy, right? And you want to get the original clean image. Now the question is, how could you do that? Um, do you have, how would you train this? So you could do supervise, so you could do a combination of supervision because you know that these images, uh, that these are numbers. Let's say you're assuming that these are numbers and you've already got it trained on, on numbers which are handwritten, right? And so if you use those data and use uh, supervised data, then what you could do exactly what you're doing. So, so this is an example. So, okay, but it's slightly more complex. So what you also need to do is you need to be able to train a, a neural network, which can take a lossy, which can take a corrupted image and train that on a, on exactly as you said on the on the train on labeled data okay but the input has to be what in order to train the weights the input should the input be a completely clean image or it should be a lossy image you want to go from a lossy image to uh, you want to go from a, sorry a noisy image to a clean image right 
you want to train the neural network to be able to learn how to go from a from a noisy image to a to a clean image so when you're going to train that what is the input should be it should be noisy you want to give you want to show it that if you get a noisy image and here's the trained clean image then learn the weight so that it can do it okay so this is exactly what you're going to do you're going to take a normal image you're going to add noise so that it can be trained you're going to train this using an encoder decoder so that it compresses it it learns the basic features okay so it knows that these are 1 2 3 now it doesn't necessarily have to be 1 2 3 now okay it could be any kind of images but it's now going to learn the basic features of that image sort of a compressed version of that image then it's going to decode it and then it's going to um, it, so it's going to go through a cyclical process okay so a slight change in what i said you don't necessarily need to have a in this case you don't necessarily need to have labeled data okay now you can see why why because if you take the original image you add noise it becomes your noisy image okay you decode it and then what are you going to train it on you going to train it on the original image okay very simple so again is this an example of um a, uh, you know which kind of machine learning is this is supervised or unsupervised it's supervised but but does does a human being have to label all the data so what are we doing we taking any image from the internet okay we could automatically add noise to it right an algorithm could add noise to it we going to pass it through an encoder decoder process and then we going to we going to uh, the label is going to be the original image so did anybody have to actually sit down and label that this is a number 2 no so if you don't have any manual labeling process then it's unsupervised learning okay so so again it's very it's a very powerful process all you take is if you want to be able to train on noisy images all you can do is take a million images or billion images from the internet add a process of adding noise which is automatic you could add for example something called gaussian noise which is very common okay it's taken from a distribution a gaussian distribution you add noise and then you the label is simply going to be the original image yeah sorry so there is in the auto encoder process you have both an encoder and a decoder okay it's a two stage process which also has a bottleneck so it's you can think of it as an encoder and a decoder and the bottleneck sort of says that the encoder will go into a compressed version of the neural network okay so this is a very powerful technique why is it so powerful not only because it can create this but take a look at this image so this is called neural in painting so um uh, here's an image now blocks of it has been have been lost for whatever reason okay you don't really know what's in this block but you could train it on a large number of paintings and images okay and it somehow will learn that if there is a window over here then the next window will sort of look something like this that's the beauty of 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 neural networks is that based on the amount of training it actually understands relationships in images so this is a, a neural net this is an output which has been uh, which has been received after it has been trained on something called a neural uh, in painting network okay you can you can just think how powerful it is i mean no nobody could have you could have manually done this but you can you can't imagine an an automatic network being able to reconstruct this so accurately okay so you can see that you see this over here this image was gone but it was able to see it was able to understand that when you have trees then there's a relationship between the image so that this tree will have the branch will be connected okay so it was able to reconnect that branch you you see the the immense beauty of this if it has uh, images of a, of a water fountain it is able to construct the original images quite accurately the question is does it always work well you can imagine it doesn't always work okay so here's a parrot so you can see that it tried to reconstruct it but 
Is there a problem over here? Can you see a problem with this reconstructed parrot? Okay, just look at the body. So the body has become somewhat transparent, right? Because it couldn't figure out that, you know, the, it was kind of shrouded with, with trees and so on. So it mixed it up. It mixed it partly with images of the sky as well as the trees and well of the, of the parrot. So some of it got correct. So you can see in this portion, it's got the image of the, it's got the right colors of the, of the parrot, the green and the yellow is mixed correctly. But over here, it's actually mixed in the sky with the body of the parrot. So it doesn't always work. Okay, in some cases, it will work very well. So over here again, there's another example um, over here. So you can see that it was very accurately able to recreate the boat. Okay, so this is a, a very uh, nice feature of, of neural in painting. Again, simply using an auto encoder and decoder. Okay, let's take a look at some more examples. Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Sir, for neural in painting, how, how much should the training size be equal? Okay, so the so in all of deep neural networks, remember I, I showed you this this training curve, right? If you have uh, if if you look at the amount of data versus yes. uh, you know this is deep neural network and this is the normal neural network, shallow neural network, and this is your traditional uh, traditional techniques, all right? So deep neural networks takes more and more data. In fact, this may keep on going up and up, right? This is the amount of uh, accuracy, you might say. So, okay, the, sir. Uh, so up, the better it'll get. And if you have okay, very little data, it will not work very well. Okay, sir. But my, my question was basically about, like, for example, it is filling in the mi missing pieces. So, how much, for example, 100 images, it, it has to be trained as well, right? Yeah. So I, I don't, you know, I can't give you a numerical answer on that. All I can simply is say that more, the more data you have, the better it gets. Now you might want to ask right. in this specific case, how much data was actually it, the neural network trained on? That's a specific question. I don't have an answer right. to that, but we could look this up. Okay. I, I, I think uh, I've given you the, I might've given you the link to where I got this data from. Or if you just yes. look it up on neural in painting and you'll see links to papers which have which from where this data is actually gone. And then they'll actually give you how much, they'll give you the details, exactly what was the size of the neural network, how much training did it go through before it was actually able to recreate this. Okay, so that's a good question, but I don't have an answer to that right away. Okay. Okay, sir, thank you. All right, so this is what you're basically doing and this is what I've already talked about. Uh, and this is some more examples of, of removing, for example, uh, watermarks. So for example, you have these watermarks appearing in the background. So if you go through uh, uh, you know, an, an auto encoder, you can see that it has very beautifully removed those, auto, auto, uh, those watermarks, right? So a lot of times you have, you have images which have this problem and you can see this uh, watermarks over here or somebody is actually you know, given their original. And a lot of times this happens that like, you know, the IBA uh, photographer, Rashid, he'll always put in his watermark whenever he gives you an image. So what you can now do is, if you want to get rid of that, you simply take it to an auto encoder, okay? Rashid will not be very happy with that, but you'll get your way. Okay, another very important application of auto encoders is in self-driving cars, okay? This is a, a very major application. So what an auto encoder is doing, is actually it's learning the main features of that image, okay? So here what you're saying is that I want this image to be learned to learn, let's say 10 different features, okay? And when it, it's learned it, you can actually label these and you can say, well, here, this is basically, it's learned the sky. This Sorry, green stuff, it's learned to be trees. Is there a question online? No, if not. So, so what you get is, after you've trained it and you've said that all I want is, uh, let's say a 10D version of, I want the bottleneck to only have 10 features in it, okay? So uh, this could be the 10 features, one, two, three, and so on. So let's say there are 10 features over here. And then when it comes out, it looks something like this. It'll look very simple, right? It won't look anything like the original image. This was the original image and this is what the decoded image is. But why is it useful? 
you can obviously that it is useful why because now it has actually been able to you can classify the image and you can say well i don't really care what's all of this right all i can do is now i can label this that this is trees or shrubs and so on right and now i can see that this here these objects these look like cars okay there are three cars over here so i can call them vehicles right a human person can actually label so now this is a mixture of what is it mixture is it now purely um, sorry it's it's both you can say that you know it's a machine learning with both um, you know a, you know a combination okay so not only is it actually using uh, humans involved in this but it's also got an automatic part so this part is coming out to be automatic and this part is where somebody is actually manually labeling them okay so once you've labeled this you can see that um well for example over here there is a sign label all right so these are coming out to be signs okay uh you know there are road markings so now the most important thing for 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 example if you're using this for self driving what you want to know is where the road markings okay so if you see over here maybe not so obvious but it will show you some of the road markings over here as well so you can see that in the orange portion yeah uh, that's visible over here okay so it's able to figure out where the road markings are and once you know where the road markings are that would be very critical in our in order to be able to uh, maneuver your vehicle okay because you don't want it to go into the shrubs you don't want it to it to go into the curb you don't want it to go into humans and so on right so that's where um, you know auto encoders can be extremely powerful when you're talking about self driving so um, that sort of covers the topic of three different examples that i've shown you of how cnns can be extended to you know capsule networks they can be extended in time they can be auto encoded and so on there are a lot of other examples as well but uh, let me uh, not go over those now let me show you an example of an online example of what is referred to as a cfar network this is a canadian network um and it has uh, um the nice thing about this is that it is available online and you can play around with this as well so this is a cfar network um and if you go and link on some of these yeah so this is the cfar network um and if you click on on the data set it will show you what the details of the data set okay so uh like you were earlier asking you know what what the amount of involvement of the training is so here you can actually control it okay so the cfar network data set consists of a total of 10 as the number here indicates 10 different classification 10 different types of objects has been trained on 10 different objects and these are simply airplanes automobiles birds and so on all the way up to trucks it's been trained uh, you can train it on 60000 different images which have a combination of these 10 different uh, images okay and uh, these are all labeled so somebody has actually manually gone through the process of actually doing this this is probably one of the phd students uh, over there who did this and now you can train it based on different types of network so what this uh, i've been training this for a while but let me just restart this so if i duplicate this i can use different training learning rates for example i could use a learning rate of 0.01 or i could have a learning rate of 0.03 i could change this uh momentum is something we haven't talked about but basically momentum what it does is remember we talked about um when you doing gradient descent you could get stuck in a local minima right what were the techniques that we learned to be able to get out of a local minima does anybody remember that how did you get out of a local minima think back flash back so 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 it searched for different paths uh, remember simulated annealing that was one of the techniques when you the other techniques were evolutionary algorithms right so momentum is just another technique what it does is you can think of it as a ball so you imagine taking a heavy ball and you make it roll down and when it gets to the bottom you will have a certain momentum right so it won't get stuck in that local minimum it will have momentum and it will go to the next level okay so that's all there is to it so you can use different momentums over here you have batch sizes you basically train on that 
you have a weight decay, which also shows you how fast you can uh, train this. And then um, your neural network is basically looks something like this. This is the key component of the neural network. Remember in a neural network, you need to decide the architecture. Okay, so here this architecture is, is fixed and it says that I will have uh, an input. So these input images are already 32 by 32. Okay, and it will have a depth of three, which means it's a color image. Okay, uh, it will have how many convolutional layers? There's a convolutional layer here, there's another convolutional layer. So it has three convolutional layers, one after another. Okay, this is how you interpret this, this code over here. Um, most of these codes are similar. So for example, in TensorFlow, it will have also a similar kind of encoding. Uh, it will specify the, the convolution size. So it is a five by five filter. Okay, remember the filter has to be specified. Uh, sorry, this is a 16 by 16 filter, but um, it has different components. For example, a stride, a pad, and so on. The activation has to be uh, being specified over here as being a ReLU activation. It could have been other activations as well. Uh, then it has a, a max pool layer, which has a stride of two and a size of two by two. Okay. And then at the end, it has something called a soft max. Okay. Now I didn't really talk about soft max, but remember I said that if you have two numbers, if, if it's coming out with two numbers, Y1 and Y2, those could represent approximately how, what is the importance of whether it's a Y1 image or Y2. Okay, so what softmax simply does is it simply converts that into a probability. Okay, so for example, if I said that the the y1 is is two, and y y1 is two and y2 is one. Okay, so that means that uh, one of them is twice as probable as the other, right? But is this a probability distribution? Clearly not, right? So if I said that one of these are, uh, the output is for example, um, Y1 is a two and a Y2 is a one. That means this is twice as probable as this, right? But this is not a probability. So if you want to convert this to a probability, all you could do is add these up. This is a three and you could make this two thirds and you could make this one third. Now two thirds would now simply say that the probability of Y1 image is 66% and the probability of Y2 image is 33%. So now it's a probability distribution, okay? So that's just to give you what softmax does. It simply converts it to a probability distribution. I'm giving you a, a sort of very quick understanding of what this network is, okay? Now, if you look at it, as you train this, so let's say as I'm training this, it's actually going to train it in real time. So I'm going to, let's say, rest so this is training in real time. And as it's training it, uh, you can look at the output images and this is the input image. This is one of the input images. And these are the images as the, of the outputs of the different filters, okay? You can see that this is a frog. Uh, now it's changed into another uh, creature and so on. And it's actually trying to train it. So you can look at the different images that it's trying to learn. And as it's learning it, you can also see that the probabilities that it's assigning. So here it's basically saying that the probability that this thing over here is a, is a car is higher versus a truck. So these are the three highest probabilities that's associated with this. Now it's not been trained for, trained for a long time. So let's take a look at the one which was trained a little longer. So this was trained a little longer. This was about an hour ago. So now you can see that it's doing a better job. So here, where, the, where it's showing a green uh, uh, bar, that's an accurate, um, you know, it's made, made a correct um, prediction. So here it's saying that this is a horse. Okay, I'm just going to stop it for a minute. So it doesn't keep on training. Um, I don't know how I can stop it. But anyway, let's take a look at this image that I've drawn over here. So here, uh, this is accurately saying that this is a frog. Okay, but it's slightly got a less probable that this is, could also be a car, it could also be a truck, it's not very good. Okay, but between the 10 things, it was able to say that it's most likely a frog. Okay, similarly, it was able to say that this is most likely a frog, this is most likely a ship, this is most likely a truck, but guess what? It says this is most likely a cat, whereas in fact, it is neither a cat nor a bird nor a dog. Okay, so all three of its top predictions were inaccurate. Uh, this is quite accurate, this is wrong. 
It's showing that this is a deer or a bird or a dog. What do you think this actually is? Looks like a frog, right? So here it got it wrong. But you can see that as you train it for longer and longer periods, you can, you can play with this as well. That just go onto this network and let it play, let it keep on run for as long as you want. And eventually you'll start seeing that it becomes more and more accurate as the weights are trained better and better.